Hello, and welcome back to Sociology 101. Today, we're going to ask the question once again, does regeneration precede faith? In other words, are you given new life? It's what regeneration is, being born again. Does that precede you having faith? Or do those who believe get new life? Well, according to the scripture, I think it's quite clear. We've seen this uh, quite a few times, but I'll pull it up again for those that need to see it again. You see from John chapter 5, beginning there in verse 40, speaking to the Pharisees, you were unwilling to come to me so that you may have life, Jesus says. He didn't say, I refuse to give you life so that you would certainly come to me. Jesus' ordo salutis is that you must come to him in order to have life. We also see this over in John chapter 20, verse 31. Therefore, many other signs Jesus performed in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these have been written so that you may believe. So the gospel has been written. These truths have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. So how do you have life in his name? According to the scripture, you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ so as to be given new life. But this is the crux of the entire argument that we have with our Calvinist friends. Even R.C. Sproul lays this out for us pretty clearly. Listen, if you will. And the whole dispute is over the question of the order of salvation, which comes first, faith or being born again. Because if there's anything that is unique to Reformed theology, it is the idea that regeneration or rebirth precedes faith. That is, it's a logical precession, not necessarily a temporal one, but the, 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 the chicken and the egg here, regeneration comes first and then faith. Okay, so there you heard it from a leading Calvinist source that says this whole crux, the crux of this entire debate, really rests upon this one central view, that we have to be given new life, or we have to be raised to new life in order to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, when the scripture seems to indicate quite the opposite as the verses we've already looked at and many others uh, in other episodes that we've talked through. Uh, this is one of the reasons I asked this question of Joel Webin in my debate on Remnant Radio with him on the question, as does regeneration precede faith? Uh, here was that exchange. All right, do you believe that one, is, you know, we're talking about regeneration preceding faith. So do you believe one is raised to new life so as to have faith? Yes. Okay. But in Colossians 2.12, it says you were raised with him through your faith. So it sounds like through faith means that's the instrumental means by which we're raised with Christ. How do you explain something like that? And I'll give you a, a second to open it up if you need to. Colossians, Colossians 2.12, 2, and I'm quoting, you were raised with him through your faith. So it seems to me, even if you believe that faith is irresistibly or effectually given to the elect, it still is the instrumental means by which one is raised. So it must logically precede the being raised, at least in Colossians 2.12. Mm, Having been buried with waiting. him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith, in the powerful working of God, who raised him, being Christ, from the dead. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. And your question is saying, you believe that Colossians 2.12 is saying that through faith, that faith is ultimately what gains us that raising. It's the instrumental means by which we're raised. Because it says through faith. It doesn't say you're raised unto faith or you're raised in order to have faith. It says you're raised through faith. So faith seems to be the instrumental means by which we're raised, which is one of the reasons I think maybe George Whitfield and others don't believe in pre-faith regeneration, but they're Calvinists. And they hold to a different view that says ultimately that we're something else like an effectual calling precedes our, our, our being, uh, becoming uh, believers, but that regeneration itself doesn't come until after we actually uh, have faith in God. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's just multiple other texts that would say precisely the opposite. I think there are other texts that speak of. Uh, what what, is, what do you think again. is the best text that clearly teaches that faith? Okay, and so instead of answering what he believes about Colossians 2.12, he just says, well, there's other texts that, that indicate this, which doesn't give us an answer to Colossians 2.12. And Joel recognized this. Joel was a humble, godly man and recognized 
where he fell short. And I know it's very nerve wracking in a debate when you're first presented with things that you haven't thought through and you're having to think through them on the fly. That's that's a hard thing to do. Not everyone can do that. I certainly don't do it very well. Uh, I try my best. And, and Joel handled himself very well in the debate. I'm very very cordial man that I, I enjoyed having a sparring contest with, with regard to our various views. But he brought, he brought this question up again in his discussion with James White recently. And I wanted you to hear this discussion. You know, I, this is my first time talking with you, but I, you know, I watched your debate with Leighton Flowers mm -hmm. on Romans 9, and then I threw my hat in the ring, um, mutual acquaintance of, of him and myself, Remnant Radio. I think you've been on Remnant Radio before, and yeah. uh, Michael Roundtree is one of the co-hosts, and, uh, and he's a friend of mine. And so, uh, so anyways, Michael was like, dude, you should debate Leighton. And I was like, I don't think I'm, you know, qualified. But anyway, so I, just, I went for it, and... Um, yeah, it's uh, it's a lot easier to preach a sermon on Calvinism than it is to debate. Uh, debating is, it's hard to be cross-examined. And so I can see, my point is, I can see how people would come to faith because, um, man, when you can when you can defend something, not just give an hour homily, but when you can argue something, be cross-examined and, uh, and hold, uh, it's powerful. Now, that being said, that this wasn't the purpose of getting you on the show, but <laughs> the, hardest, the hardest thing I had with Leighton was... Um, and, and I'm sure I, I should have had a better answer, but Colossians 2, verse 12, I'm curious your take on this. So, so this is, on the, in the cross-examination, this is where I, I looked the most well, foolish. Wait a what, uh, what, was, what, was the, what was the topic? So the topic was total depravity, and he does, you know, so total inability, yeah, yeah. and he says, yeah, you're totally depraved, you're totally sinful, but you're not totally unable, and so that was his whole thing. Whereas, like, election, you could argue, I, this is me, but I, I feel like, I didn't really know what I was getting into. I, I should have debated him on limited atonement or election. Uh, total depravity was was harder. Um, but anyways, so he he went to, you know, it's not total inability. And he used Colossians 2, verse 12, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith. And so he was like, so you see, Joel, raised through faith, not raised to faith, right? Regeneration preceding faith, but raised through faith. Your faith is what raised you. Now, I, the text, the context, it seems, you know, it's, it's referring to baptism. Again, Colossians 2, verse 12 is where he hung his hat, and, uh, and I struggled. I'll, I'll admit I struggled. And so I'm curious, well, what, what, how would you respond? Well, Okay, before we hear James White's response, he does set up the discussion pretty well. Joel's fair. He's humble enough to admit that he felt like he was stumped uh, with that particular question. He could have answered it better. We've all been there. That doesn't necessarily make him wrong just because I stumped him on a particular question. I'm sure uh, I've been stumped on questions before in a live cross-examination because I wasn't prepared for that particular question. That That's not the issue. The issue is, do Calvinists have a good answer even when they have time to prepare, uh, even when they can think things through? Or do they resort to ad hominem? Do they resort to, to the man type of arguments? Um, do they dodge the question by talking about a different topic uh, like what does Leighton mean by baptism? Um, Leighton doesn't really exegete anything. Um, he just pulls things out of context, these kinds of things, all to the man type of arguments instead of answering what even Joel presented as a good argument that needs to be answered here. And before you listen to Dr. White, look, look at the text with us just real quickly. Um, just so that you can see where, where we're talking about here in Colossians chapter 12, back in verse 9, for in him, remember in him is a phrase that Paul uses all the time. We see it in Ephesians, especially Ephesians chapter 1, that whole big long sentence, uh, the longest sentence in the New Testament, uh, uses in him like 10 different times in just those 13 verses, that one sentence. And so in him is kind of a, a Pauline uh usage uh, that's that's quite regular throughout his writings. And so you see this here in, in Colossians as, as well. For in him, in Christ, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. There's there's a good verse right there, by the way, if you're looking for the deity of Christ, <laughs> defending the deity of Christ, there, there's a great verse. Paul obviously believes in the deity of Christ. Uh, for in him, all the fullness of de deity dwells in bodily form. And in him, you have been made complete. So when are we made complete? Are we made complete so as to be put into him, or is it in him that we are made complete? I think all of us could agree, regardless of what side you are uh, on the theological, sociological bubble. It, it doesn't really matter. I think all of us would say it's in him that we are made complete. It's not we're made complete so as to be put into him, but in him that we are made complete. 
and he is the head over all rule and authority. And in him, you were also circumcised with a circumcision without hands. So he's obviously not talking about physical circumcision. He's talking about a physical circumcision. Are we circumcised spiritually in order to be put in him? Or are we in him so as to be circumcised? Well, look what it says. In him, you were also circumcised. So it's in him that you receive the spiritual blessings. It's in him that you are circumcised spiritually in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Okay. And no, notice the term here in verse 12, having been, so that's, that's past tense. So this is, this is a state we are already in because we're in Christ. And so having been buried with him, that's a part of being in him, buried with with him in baptism, this is a spiritual baptism. I don't think this is a reference to uh, water baptism at all. Matter of fact, the word buried there indicates this because you're not literally buried. The reason we do immersion as Baptist is because baptism means literally immersion and it's being put under. You don't just sprinkle dirt on somebody to bury them. You put them six feet under. You bury them. You, you immerse them in the water as a symbol of them being dead. So buried in him in baptism represents the death that takes place with Christ, okay? In which you were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God. So once again, you're buried with him. This is what we do every time we do baptism. You hear that quoted. You are, you are buried with him and raised to walk in newness of life. You show you're put under the soil and you're raised up with him through faith. Faith, therefore, is the instrumental means by which one is raised. And therefore, quite clearly, it seems that faith, temporally or logically, it wouldn't matter which we are arguing, faith is the instrumental means by which one is raised. So even if Calvinists argue, well, faith is an irresistible gift that's given to the elect and the elect only. It's this miracle that, causes, that God causes faith. Okay, even if I were to concede that, you still have faith here preceding being raised, new life. You still have, just like in John 20, 31, believing so as to have life. You refuse to come to me so as to have life. You still have life coming after faith and through the instrumental means of faith, not the other way around. I think this stumps the Calvinist. I have not heard a good cognizant answer, a rational good answer. The, the best answers I've heard from Calvinist are the Calvinists who don't adopt this pre-faith regeneration perspective like we heard from Chris Date and um, Robert Wiesner, I believe it was, who were both on the program talking about why they reject the normal Calvinist phraseologies uh, and terminology of believing that that in pre-faith regeneration. And they will talk about some kind of a, a different kind of an effectual calling, but not regeneration because of verses like this and because of so many other texts that obviously indicate that new life or being raised up comes through faith, not unto faith, as the Calvinists often argue. Now, with that said, Let's listen to James White and see if, if he actually answers this question from Joel that Joel's posing, or if he resorts to fallacious arguments and kind of dodging the issue. You, you be the judge for yourself. I'll play it. Well, um, you, you, you'd have to go back to an argument that we have with, uh, that I have with my uh, on the subject of baptism here, because if you look at Colossians 2.11, in him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, and the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Well, what is that? Um, Richard Brasellus argues uh, in his exegesis of 2.11-12 um, that while some people argue that uh, what you have here is the connection of circumcision and baptism. This is actually regeneration. Mm. So if this, uh, the circumcision, uh, circumcised the circumcision made without hands mm. is in fact, the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, if that's regeneration, then that is the work of God. And mm. Okay, so we all believe that the circumcision without hands is a work of God, but who is he doing that work on? Those who are in Christ are those who are elect unconditionally and caused to believe so as to be placed in Christ 
I mean, I mean you got to make that argument. You can't just make the argument that this is a work of God. We all believe it's a work of God. Um, oftentimes you'll hear Calvinists refer to Ephesians chapter 2 and talking about how we're dead, but he raised us to life. Um, is he just unilaterally picking people and just raising people he just picked unilaterally to life? Or is he raising to life those who put their trust in him? Um, and that's why I often refer back to Ephesians chapter 1 in, in talking about the concept of in him, because remember what we read there in verse 13 of Ephesians 1. In him, you also, after listening to the message of truth. So what's the order? In him, you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. So when were you sealed in him? After listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believing in it. That's when you're sealed in him. So when are you circumcised without hands? When do you have that spiritual circumcision? Go back over to Colossians. Look what it says. In him, you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. So it's in him, in him, the scripture says, that you were also circumcised. Even goes on to say, having been buried with him in baptism. Having been, that means it's it's past completed. It Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also you were also raised with him. How? Through the instrumental means of faith. So he doesn't just unilaterally or arbitrarily pick people and raise them up so as to place them in him. No, he raises up those who have faith, those who believe in him. That's the, the order of salutis here in this text and in every other. So go back to what James is saying. It's not his, it's not his intention at this point to be discussing the relationship uh, or the, even the issue of the ability of a person dead in sin, but even still, uh, you were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. Um, if he's trying to make this a, a ordo salutis type thing, where, That's what he was doing. where faith is now um, prior to regeneration, Mm-hmm. If circumcision, if this, if the circumcision done without hands is regeneration, then that that's not the case. That no, that's a, absolutely false. Um, as as demonstrated, it's in Him that you have the circumcision without hands. It's in Him that you have the spiritual blessings. Otherwise, you have all of that happening outside of Christ. Surely, you don't want to argue that 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 happens outside of Christ, do you? It's only in Christ that we have these spiritual blessings. Otherwise, you would have people who are spiritually circumcised, i.e. alive, who aren't in Christ. And that's why that's why you hear people like Sproul in his argument there saying, well, it's not a temporal order, it's a logical order, because they realize this. And so this that's why they have to they have to say, well, you know, it's just a logical order. It's a, it's a simultaneous. It happens immediately, so that you're immediately in him, but they have to put the logical order. But then but they they, they still don't have a text that supports this concept. It's just the systematic supporting the concept, not the text itself. Because if faith is instrumental means by which we are raised, then that is not only the temporal order, that has to be also the logical order. That is that is coming first. But I don't even know how he would make that work, because did he say how he understood this baptism? Is he saying that you believe after baptism? Yeah, his... Is he say, does James White... He's a Baptist like I am. We're both Baptists. Does he really believe that I believe or I teach that people don't believe until after baptism. This is, this is just a red herring. This is a, Hey, look over here. Look over here. I don't know how to answer the actual issue. Joel just raised. So look over here. Layton probably just doesn't believe the same thing we do about baptism, even though he knows full well, I'm a Baptist, just like he is. I believe exactly what he believes about believers baptism. Uh, I'm a creed of Baptist, just like he is. <laughs> so th- this is a, this is a red herring. What a red herring is in a debate is when you try to bring up something to distract the audience from the point being asked, so as to make people focus on that instead of on the actual point being asked, as if I believe something different about baptism than he does. Well, he was just using it to counter uh, John chapter three. You can't, you know, I was making the argument, you can't even see the kingdom uh, unless you've been born again. And then he was basically using Colossians 2, 12 and... He, he completely stripped it from the context of baptism. He was just saying, look, you're raised through faith. So faith is what raised ra- Baptism represents the burial. That's the death side of it. So death is burial. 
baptized, you're dead with him, okay, and in him. And then you're raised to new life. You're raised from that dead in him, right? You're raised through faith. That's the point. And they're not addressing that, at least so far. Raises you. So regeneration, he was, you know, likening regeneration to the word raise and then saying, you know, you're raised through your faith, which means faith precedes re regeneration, which means before you become a new creation, you cannot be completely unable. Uh, so to total depravity, he was like, I affirm total depravity because that's what Leighton does. He, he affirms words, but then hijacks their meaning. So I well, affirm first, total yeah. depravity, but it, it can't mean total. Well, even Calvinists have admitted that the term total depravity doesn't connote exactly what they want it to connote. Um, and obviously you can affirm the concept, an idea that people are depraved without affirming their inability to confess that fact in light of the gospel. Those are two totally different things. Affirming a man's sinfulness and his corruption is different than affirming the incapacity of that man to confess his corruption in light of the law and the gospel. And that's what the Calvinists often do. They conflate things, put them into one thing, quote a bunch of passages which prove one thing as if it's proving the other. And we simply have to call them out on that and say, brothers, we love you, but you can't assume that just because the Bible says that we're sinful and corrupt and haters of God and in bondage to sin, therefore we can't recognize that fact so as to be reconciled when he calls us to that. Um, we, we can give example after example after example of even uh, unbelievers in the unbelieving world having a hatred and animosity towards another person, but yet what? Humbling themselves, confessing their animosity, and being reconciled with that person they were once in enmity with. Just saying that, that we are at enmity with God, just saying that we are in bondage to sin is not enough to prove total moral inability, i.e. The, the T of TULIP. You must find passages which go further than that to say, ultimately, even God's solution, the life-giving truth of the gospel, the appeal that's made through us, the bride, to the world to be reconciled to God, that appeal isn't sufficient for any lost person unless they were unilaterally picked before they were born and effectually given a new heart and new nature so that they will certainly believe the truth. This, again, we just don't find established anywhere in the pages of Scripture. Inability, that's unbiblical. That, that was that was his argument, as I remember it. Well, I would I'd be interested in hearing what his argument was, because I'm not following it, because in which also you were raised up through faith in the working. And, and it's 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 diates pista os taste in our gaios to you. So through faith in the in the working of God, the one who raised him from the dead. Um, I'd want to. I'd want to know what. Leighton doesn't give you complete exegesis of texts. When you press him on a text, he'll say, "Well, it might something here might mean that, and that might mean that, and that might mean that." But he doesn't ever want to commit himself to what something most certainly does mean. And so, I'd want to know how he thinks twelve and eleven relate, because it sounds like, from his perspective. What he's saying is this faith is coming after baptism, which does not make any sense whatsoever. Um, the right. point faith is coming after baptism. Joel knows better than this. Why didn't Joel say, no, no, Leighton's not saying faith comes after baptism. Nobody's saying faith comes after baptism. That, that's absurd. And why are you bringing, bringing that up unless you're just confused enough not to be able to answer the question? And why are you even bringing up your, your opinion about whether I exegete text or not? If you don't have a good argument to make about the argument being presented, what do you do? You attack the man. Oh, Leighton just doesn't do exegesis. He just doesn't exegete text. Oh, well, you're doing cross-examinations. You're not supposed to give an exegesis of a text. You're supposed to ask a question. So have you gone to my other sources? Have you looked at my other broadcast or my books on the subject where I've exegeted text before? No. You, you, you make a, a, a kind of a generalized statement about the person without any cooperating evidence, without any citations, is in order to what? This is a, this is another red herring. It's a straw man. It's a to the man type of argument so that I can distract the audience from this obvious conclusion that you're raised to new life through faith. That's an obvious statement. And, and Joel, the reason he was stumped wasn't because I was trying to say that <laughs> faith comes after baptism. Oh yeah, right, right after we're raised up out of the water, we come up and we go, oh, now I believe in Jesus. It is so absurd and, and so ridiculous. The fact that Joel, who is a reasonable brother and seems very uh, sharp, 
wouldn't call James out on this. Maybe it's just kind of the, he's his guest and kind of a, a mentor to him and he doesn't want to call him out in front of his audience. I, I don't know why Joel would allow that to stand. I, I really don't. But this is the kind of absurdity that sometimes you begin to hear from Calvinists when they are pushed back with the text saying, okay, how do you explain this passage? Give us a good explanation of what you think this passage means instead of attacking the person who's bringing the argument. Let's pretend that somebody besides Leighton Flowers brought the argument. Let's pretend Michael Brown. You like Michael Brown, James White. You think he's a reasonable fella. You, you respect him. You, you, you haven't painted all of the pictures of him as being this you know, raging traditional provisionist or whatever that you've, you've painted me in. Let's just pretend that Michael Brown made the exact same argument. Now, how would you answer the argument? Because you know Michael Brown doesn't believe, just like you know I don't believe, that faith comes after baptism. So you're not going to use that as your red herring against Michael Brown. So why don't you pretend Michael Brown made the exact same argument, and then you can give us an answer to it? That might help. God bless. Share Christ and show love. See you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>